Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight, the 17th of November, 2023, Joel Evans, who lives just a hop, skip, and a jump from Whiting Farms, is going to talk about whiting and the feathers. And the weekly tip, well, we're going to talk to you about containers. We got a little surprise last weekend, and we're going to share it with all of you. But we're the Beaties from Boise, Idaho, and tonight we're going to be spotlighting Joel Evans to... Um, from, from Colorado. We've known him for a number of years. Hey, there you go, buddy. And uh, I'll get right out of there. Remove spotlight. There's Joel. Joel has lived in Montrose, Colorado for over 40 years, where he combines fishing, guiding, writing, photography, and fly tying. As a writer, he is a regular outdoor columnist with the Montrose Daily Press, where he has written articles since 1996 and is the flight time columnist for the High Country Angler, contributing both articles and videos. He has had other articles and photographs published in newspapers, magazines, and fishing guides. He used to write a comedy piece for me back in the days when Gretchen and I were the editors of Fly Fisher Magazine. Anyway, continuing, Joel has taught hundreds of kids and adults the art of fly tying. He joined Trout Unlimited decades ago as a charter member of the Gunnison Gorge Anglers. He has served as president, president and most everything else there is to be. He currently serves on the state board of Colorado Trout Unlimited, as well as the regional board of Fly Fishers International, Eastern Rocky Mountain Council, and is a member of the FFI Fly Tying Group. Major stream improvements to the Umcompadre River have been a passion project for Joel for decades. Probable or notable past successes have included the catch and race quality water below Ridgeway Dam, new access within stream structures within the city limits of Montrose, a current project involving a new business park with river frontage for which Joel is on the river design committee. His reel is engraved, thanks, Dad, as a tribute to his father, E.T. Evans, who took his son fishing at an early age. Now, this is important, so listen carefully, folks. Joel has been through the Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park at the River Canyon Bottom on foot twice. One of only a few would ever do this high-risk adventure. Now, don't yawn and think I'm just yammering on. That's kind of like climbing Mount Everest, only it's more dangerous. <laughs> and you think I'm joking? I'm not. But anyway, Joel, it's all yours. Tell us all about it. Thanks, Al, Gretchen, and everybody joining in tonight. Thanks for joining. So appreciate the introduction there. So, um, yeah, in the introduction, uh, Al mentioned my dad. So I'm going to start there, hold this up. You can't see that necessarily well, but that's a magazine article uh, about my dad. And so pretty typical story. Dad got me started in fly fishing. I have some of my reels engraved that say thanks dad and uh, uh, I always say dad showed me Colorado and trout fishing so um, I'm in Montrose that's in western Colorado um, if you're familiar with uh, the state um, most of the population and the plains are on the east side of the continental divide Continental Divide runs through the middle of the state, and then the western side of the state is towns like uh, Steamboat Springs and Grand Junction, Gunnison, uh, Telluride, Uire, Durango, and Montrose is kind of in the middle of that. So Montrose is not right in the mountains, but uh, near the mountains. And I came here in 1980, and fishing was one reason, but many others, work and some things. But... Um, what I wanted to feature tonight, to get right into that, is uh, for whatever reason, Montrose has become somewhat of a uh, manufacturer, fly fishing manufacturer center. So for a long time, not just recently, a long time, uh, Ross Reels has been here. Uh, now, of course, uh, Abel Reels and uh, Airflow Fly Lines, and more recently, they've added Dyna King Vices. And then Scott Rods, and then just down the road, uh, 20 miles from Montrose, is Delta, Colorado, and that's where Whiting Farms is. So Dr. Tom Whiting uh, established there many, many years ago. And uh, so 
it just seemed natural to me on this video uh, Zoom that maybe I'd um, I'll do a couple of patterns at the end, but I thought it might be more educational to um, talk about whiting. Now, I know uh, on this call are mostly uh, highly experienced tires. You've all used genetic fly tying hackle, and so some or a lot of what I have tonight may not necessarily be new to you, but I just thought it'd be kind of fun to refresh that and like I said, it's in my backyard, so I kind of like to talk about it. I um, also want to recognize that, you know, Whiting's not the only producer of genetic fly tying feathers. There's other companies that produce a great product, um, no notably Mets and some others out there. So, you know, Whiting's not the only one, but I focus on them because, well, they're in my backyard. So Whiting began in 1989. Uh, prior to that, there were other feather producers. Uh, history shows uh, names like uh, Henry Hoffman, uh, Ted Hebert, Andy Miner, Harry Darby, Buck Metz, and others. Of course, in the evolution of the United States and uh, population growth and fly fishing, it sort of uh, started more centered in the east and midwest uh, as it migrated more uh, to the west. So most of those names are kind of more uh, historically eastern type of uh, chickens, if you will. But uh, Henry Hoffman uh, was actually in the northwest. And so that's where Dr. Tom Whiting started Whiting Farms in 1989. He acquired the uh, birds, the stock of uh, Henry Hoffman. And just to speak to Tom, a uh, great guy, very personable. Uh, if you're ever in the area, you might try to connect with him. And uh, um, the the companies um, like Ross, Scott, Whiting, they'll do some tours if you're in the area. Uh, Whiting has had to sort of back off on that a little bit because of uh, disease, avian bird flu and so forth. They're very, very strict about uh, who gets in uh, at the buildings and how they allow access to that. But uh, anyway, um, that's uh, out there. Uh, Tom's background is in poultry genetics and he had some commercial uh, poultry experience. And he just kind of took all that with his formal education, his PhD, and uh, put the uh, passion for education and uh, the science, uh, commercial production all together. And I was just, he said, I'm, I'm going to do this with chickens and do fly tank feathers. He might tell you a little different story, but that's kind of my understanding. And they have grown to be the largest producer of fly tying feather, genetic fly tying feathers in the United States. So um, 1989, Hoffman line acquired, Tom gets going. Uh, in uh, mid nineties, uh, Tom acquired some stock from the Hebert line. And that uh, was to somewhat expand the product line as Whiting was doing pretty well and needed some diversity, both genetically and then the product line. And then uh, if you look at all the list of the different products that Whiting has, we'll go over that in a minute. Um, they have uh, developed also some lines in house, uh, American Hackle, Spay Hackle, Brahma, some of those. And then um, somewhere in the 90s there also, um, we hear the uh, product name Coq de Leon, and those are originally historically birds from Spain, and Tom was able to get some uh, birds or eggs, whatever, uh, to start uh, that line uh, in the Whiting Farms business. So um, if you were to come to Delta, Whiting, uh, you know, has a typical administrative building, but really uh, all of the operations are in uh, barns and, you know, it's all climate controlled, modern uh, production of uh, 
breeding and eggs and incubation and hatching all the way through the harvesting of the birds and the cleaning and the packaging. That's all done at this facility in Delta. They do have a second location because of disease risk. Something happened at one location. You, you know, can't risk as a business losing all your birds and products. So um, they have for redundancy and um, volume production. They do have a second location. But otherwise, this is kind of all in this area. Uh, whiting does uh, has grown from uh, just kind of a domestic operation uh, for their sales. They're international. Uh, big markets are like Japan, Europe, Canada, um, South America. Uh, did we have somebody on a call tonight from Australia, right? So, um, you know, they're available there, I believe. So uh, pretty much in most of the uh, countries of the world that would, you know, engage in fly fishing and fly tying. So uh, very, very well known throughout the uh, world and very uh, respected um, brand of fly as a fly manufacturer. So uh, one of the things that um, is a little different with whiting uh, that came out of typically the, um, historically the uh, chicken pelts, of course, there were were, still are, um, low quality pelts from India and other places, then that's kind of where uh, fly tires generations before us got their feathers. But um, when they did that, it uh, wasn't really a grading system. And then the other companies like Kaufman and Metz and so forth uh, came up with, well, you know, let's have a grading system like a number one, a number two, number three. And actually, uh, I thought this is kind of interesting. If I can show this, I have this in my, I don't know what I call it inventory, I call it uh, collection maybe. So it's in a plastic package, maybe not quite C, but over, over uh, C camera. Over here, Hoffman Super K. Super. Super K. And then up here, grade number one. And it's a white uh, cape with a hen saddle on the other side. And it's, it's white, so it doesn't show up very well in this. But let me back off here a little bit. I want you to notice as a super cape how big it is. You know, 8, 10 inches or something there. And so at that time, that was the best of the best. And so over the years, of course, we have accelerated to um, longer and more uh, valuable uh, uh, capes and saddles and other products. So these are just a few of things from some of my inventory, but here's a gold. So gold up here in the whiting grading system they changed to a they initiated a olympic grading system so rather than one two three uh, the uh, product is graded initially gold silver and bronze and then tom got so good at the breeding and better and better he threw a platinum on top of that so there's actually platinum and um i don't own one but there are ultra Platinums, which of course are pretty rare. You got to kind of know somebody to get those, I think. So uh, that's how you choose. And of course, the grading system uh, is based upon the quality of the pelt. So uh, something like uh, this one, Ebert Minor Gold. You see the length of those, and even uh, are so long, they fall out of the package now. So it's based upon length, number of feathers within the pelt, the stiffness of each individual feather, the size range, of course, on a rooster cape, got small uh, size, hook sizes accommodated by the feathers up at the top of the neck. 
and then the consistency of the long feathers throughout. So these would tie some range. So all of those go into that grading system. They're individually hand graded. Every pelt is looked at, uh, gone through for consistency so that when you buy or shop, look for a, and there's also a, a pro grade. Uh, that's a less expensive line, but not quite the number of flies or quality. But if you're looking for uh, a silver pelt, you can know that it's better than a bronze, but not quite as good as a gold in several different respects. And sometimes they just don't have them. It's not like, well, you know, some piece of plastic where you push a button and uh, double your production or something that takes weeks uh, to go through the production harvesting process and the, the um, genetics that Tom has developed, of course, uh, to make something better and different takes years and decades. So um, here's a uh, Coq de Leon. Uh, and here's an American hackle. It's also a cochlean. Pardo is the color. Pardo is a um, Spanish name word. Uh, inside of whiting, there's dyed feathers. So this one, American hackle orange. That's the uh, this is a, a chickaboo. So we'll talk about some of these, but would uh, imitate some natural birds like uh, partridge. Here's a chickaboo that's in these dyed orange. And then this one is a rooster saddle in a silver. I'll turn that one sideways. You can see just how long those feathers are in these packages. In order to accommodate the packages, the ends have to curl up. So inches and inches. So that's the grading system, gold, silver, bronze. Where does all that come from? Oh, I have, bear with me. Everybody else has mounted elk and deer and turkey or whatever. I take this to all my shows and demos. It gets a lot of attention. So this is a, a grizzly variant. This is a whiting taxidermied bird. Uh, there was a period where these were available for purchase, but I don't think they do that anymore. But you can see the length of the feathers at the bottom exceeding the length of the uh, uh, feet of the chicken. And so this particular bird is some years old. Those today would be even uh, better and longer. But um, I use that uh, a lot um, in fly tying demos, particularly with kids. You know, when you show somebody, even a fly tire, you say, well, here's the feathers, and okay, buy this. Well, where does that come from? So it's pretty handy to have that chicken on my demo table and say, you know, here's the neck, here's the saddle, and here's the... Um, webby chick chickaboo feathers underneath the tail and so forth so pretty fun so i have a traveling chicken um al let's talk about a hook size chart so this is a chart from whiting and if you can look at that and this uh if you take some time to go to um whiting's website you'll find uh, some of this information there in this chart I think this chart is kind of a few years old, maybe needs uh, some updating, but nonetheless, uh, let's go through that a little bit. So there at the top is a um, table one, then middle table two, table three. So this is specific to rooster capes. That's the table one at the top. And then table three at the bottom is rooster saddles. So we're not talking about hens. We're not talking about American hackle. This is whiting, capes, and saddles. And in that table one there, you'll see underneath the table a size range. 
going from left to right is size six up through size 26. And then in the middle, color coding, the light and the dark gives you a sense of which products and their grading will tie what sizes of hooks. So it goes through the whiting uh, and Hebert uh, binder and some of those others there. Uh, so just something interesting that uh, tells you what range and how to buy and uh, shop for what might be pertinent to you. I in Colorado tie and fish mostly trout flies, but um, if you're different region of the country or saltwater, then certainly uh, you're in a little different situation with what's most important to you. Uh, in the middle, this talks to the grading system of how many flies. So why is a gold a gold and why does it cost more? One reason other than quality is quantity. So in that example there, you'll see um, a, a uh, platinum can tie up to about 1,800 flies down to, at the bottom of that list, a pro-grade 300. So if you're only tying a few, a pro-grade is less expensive and would be the best uh, shopping value for you. But if you tie a lot, your cost per fly, meaning the cost per feather, um, would be less expensive over the long term by choosing the higher grade uh, saddles and capes. And then it goes into how many could be tied with different uh, sizes, half, quarter, and then the hackle packs. So the hackle packs are whiting 100s. They're a small quantity in one package designed to the 100s means you could tie 100 flies with that. And of course, that's not exact, but it's the least expensive. So for some Body just getting into it. Many of you, you know, do demos, teach other people, have classes, kids, whatever. They're not going to buy platinum and gold, but if they want four different uh, hackles, you know, grizzly variant and a dun and whatever, the most economical ways to buy those hack packs and get started with those. And then down oh, on the bottom yeah. is the. Uh, um, hook sizes for the uh, saddle. So a little different. Typically, saddle feathers are longer and would accommodate a lesser range, but a smaller hook size of feathers. Questions here, John. Or we got some questions. One, okay. what is American Hackle? Yeah, so American Hackle is a product line that... Um, uh, Tom developed in-house, mixing up some of the genetics of the different uh, um, historical lines that he came up with. So the Hebert Miner, the um, Hoffman, you know, he does a lot of experiments. There's some things that never come to market, either because he doesn't like them or something's not quite right, but that's something that he came up with in house. It's a little different. It has a different um, price point to it, also. And 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 to answer that, also, uh, um, let's go to that second chart. Yeah. So this will somewhat answer that. This is also available from Whiting. So this quick reference guide will go through. Uh, you'll see at the top Whiting, and then several lines down. Hebert Miner, Coq de Leon, and uh, American, and so forth down the line. And the different hook sizes that that will accommodate, what they might tie with, and what you'd use. So the very first line, whiting rooster capes, 6 to 24 hook size, uh, primarily for uh, dry fly hackle, as opposed to get down to the very bottom, maybe, uh, say, uh, bird fur. Bird fur is tens and larger, and it's a substitute for hair, and I have some of that. Works pretty pretty well for uh, different kinds of streamers and spay flies, and uh, uh, saltwater uses that quite a bit for uh, shrimp. So American line fits in there. Uh, that's kind of in the middle. It's uh, a lot for streamers and saltwater wet flies. Yeah, it was it was it was developed uh, out of a multi line of birds, basically as a saltwater 
uh, feather. Uh, one other thing, table one, uh, John also says, table one back on the other chart, said a gold would be able to tie size six to 24 or 26. John, that is correct. Anything more on this chart, uh, Joel? Uh, no, I think that's all on that. We'll move on on that one. So you're ready to go to the tying, or you want to stay on this chart? Uh, come come back to me a minute, and uh, let me talk a little more. Um, the um, on that uh, chart, there are the generalizations, but um, also um, checked in recently with uh, Whiting and kind of asked them what uh, for an update of what they uh, have as some of their most uh, popular sales and uh, packages and so forth. And uh, listed among that was the Cup of Leon. Uh, that's the most popular for drives and uh, Paragon flies. Um, uh, hen saddles, uh, you know, used to hen saddles were short and not much quantity, but uh, those have progressed a lot. So they're very popular for soft tackles. On one of our previous Friday night videos, the, the, the soft tackles were uh, featured, and you know you can use uh, the natural birds such as uh, partridge and grouse and so forth. But uh, the hen saddles also work well for that. Um, uh, just to, just to pause here for a second, Joel, I uh, went into the chat and posted the links on Whiting's website that has. Uh, much of the information that are on these tables. These tables are not readily available on the website. The information is, go to the chat, two links there will take you to pages that will give you that and a lot more information. Go ahead, Joel, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, um, see, I'm not looking at the chat. If there's any other <clears throat> questions, stop me there. We, we've got uh, one here. other mention is, in the lighting product line is called high and dry. Now, of course, you can um, guess from the name that it's uh, primarily as a dry fly uh, hackle, but um, it's a genetically different product that uh, includes genetically um, about 75%, uh, I think is what uh, was told, of lighting background genetically but mixed in some others and this is a product line that has a little bit different uh, slot but also a little less expensive and you know genetics progressed to the point that yesterday's good stuff is kind of just so so today such that uh, today's good stuff is just much much better and this high and dry is pretty much competing with the whiting and um, uh, capes and, and so forth. It's it's a good choice. So if you're out there shopping. And I, I'd mention also, um, uh, you know, I, I visited my um, local fly shop here and uh, went through their inventory. And, you know, in our fly tying world, we all know this, there's just so much, whether it's um, – um, thread or uh, dubbing or whatever, you know, brands, companies, colors, textures. Uh, no shop can carry all that. It's just not economically feasible for them. So same when it comes to uh, Whiting. Now, sometimes there's some things that even Whiting didn't have because, you know, again, you're not punching a button and making something. You have to grow it. But if your local shop doesn't have something you're particularly interested in, uh, they're pretty good at um, getting on the phone, checking what Whiting's inventory is, see if they've got it, and they can do some special orders for you. So you might uh, go in the shop and they've got a uh, Grizzly and a Pro Grade, and you're like, well, that's great, but I want a silver or gold. Well, talk to them and they'll come up with something probably. So uh, let's see here, uh, just a few words about uh, the feathers themselves. I'm not a scientist biologist and don't really know a lot of that, but it can make a difference in fly tying. Feathers are actually scales. 
that grow out. And uh, interestingly, the uh, uh, unlike a human hair or other uh, hair of the mammal, a, a chicken's feathers grow and then stop. So they'll just keep growing forever. So like if Tom kept a bird alive for years and years and years, it's not like its hackles would just flow across the floor like, uh, you know, a princess gown or something. They, they stop. So genetically has to work with that. Um, at the bottom of the quill is, or at the bottom of the shaft is the quill, and then the shaft is what runs up through the feather. And then uh, out extending from the feather are the uh, barbs, that uh, is what we tie around and uh, like for the dry fly hackles. And then also the little bitty feather that's on the end of the shaft is called an after feather. So there's a lot of information out there, some of that uh Maybe you heard all of that, but if that's a little new or interesting to you, I think it makes a difference in your fly tying as you progress, and particularly if you're a, a demonstrator or teacher, some interesting stuff to talk about. So um, any other questions before maybe I switch to a pattern here? A couple of patterns just to feature the whiting in several different ways. So um, Al's working with me on uh, camera and uh, clarity and uh, zooming in and so forth. So uh, we're going to uh, do a little better in some future ones. But uh, this is what I got for now. This is a small hook. So that's a what I call a vertical midge. So when I do demos, uh, you know how you go through and you start with a bare hook, put some thread on and Everybody's wondering, well, how does it end up? I think it's beneficial in tying demos to show somebody where you're going. Um, I had a, a um, speech teacher back in high school, junior high, even or something, you know, speech class. Of course, that was all pre-internet speech map debate and public speaking and so forth. And uh, he said, um, Tell them what you're going to tell them, tell it to them, and then tell them what you told them. In other words, repetition. That's what people hear and listen. So uh, in a fly tying demo sense, so I apply that and uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you what I'm telling you. So that's the end result. Uh, this particular fly is a mesh. It's designed to be fished like this vertically. So this... Uh, Para post, uh, treat the material, will help it float. And then with the whiting hackle around, just like you'd hackle the dry fly, but a very, very thin uh, thread base body only. So when you use a very light leader and you're fishing a little uh, trico hatch or something, uh, this will hang in the surface film. You can see the white post but the body will break through the surface film after it soaks up a little bit. So that's where I'm going with that one. Uh, this is a um, size 16. <clears throat> up there, size 16 dry fly. What I'm starting with. Try to do this without knocking the camera off. So then I'm using a uh, Vivas thread. It is a um, uh, six out thread uh, black. I'm particularly using Vivas in this uh, because of uh, somewhat for a small size and some strength, but also Vivas thread is is rough it has a little texture to it so um, that helps capture it on this hook because it's pretty pretty slick so i'm just going to get it started there uh, because of the slickness i'm crossing over the thread a couple of times get something to stick there before i go backwards a little bit and then uh, i can trim that off And anybody recognize those scissors? 
Al showed me those years ago, years ago, and they're just wonderful. So I'll not go into a tirade on that, but these are great fly tanks. You can keep them in your hand. You can move. You don't have to pick anything up. So I got a little base there of thread. Then I'm going to uh, add that pair of. Go ahead, move your move your hand or put your put that package behind the vise. It's out of focus. Uh, to lose it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just hold it there for a second. It'll come back. There you go. There it is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm uh, looking at my vice and not the screen. So, yeah, I'll bring it to attention. Again. Yeah, please. So, um, pair of post wing. This has been uh, pre treated with a water repellent material. So, just taking a little piece of that. Comes in somewhat of a string version. I want that end to be straight, so I'm going to clip that off here. Get it flat. And then just capture that. Can you still hear me, Al? Yes, I can. Okay. Just going to capture that. I want that because of the vertical nature of this pattern. I don't want it to lay down flat over the eye. I want it to stay up, so I'm just going to capture it a few times. Now that I've got it captured there, flip off the butt end. Then I'm going to overwrap that to cover it up. Now I'm just going to make a thread base body then back at the bin work my thread back up a few times and back and forth a few times to build a taper to do more with that for the sake of time i'll just let it go with that got a couple strays there Okay, now I'm coming back towards the front, and because I'm going to wrap a hackle on this, I need a pretty flat base. Now, if you have a tapered or shoulders on your base, you tie your hackle in and it just slips off one side or the other. So I need a little flatness there. And again, the feature of the whitey. So the uh, saddle I'm going to use is, and you'll notice the red color on the um, label, so that's, they, they actually call that Whiting's red label. So this is a rooster saddle in a bronze. You can see the length of it there and how those feathers play out. So because of the small size, I'm going to pick a very Small hackle off the top side of this. And this typical preparation for a hackle. I'm going to strip it down so the feathers, the barbs stand out. Oops, clip the ends. I don't like to strip the ends. I like the barbs cut and hanging on there. So they want to tie it in. I'll catch on the thread. Just put that on there. Perhaps I can get on this. Three or four. Capture that in, working my thread in and out of the barbs. Ram the hackle. 
And then again, to keep the um, keep the pair post, the white pair post up, rather than wood finish this, we're going to come in with a half inch tool on the end of my bodkin, bodkin, and just put that up against this eye and slip that down. And that will keep from capturing any of the pair posts, keep from capturing any of the hackle, and it'll, the right tension, it'll make that pair post stick up away from the uh, eye of the hook and the thread. No more. And that way, then you can, when you're on the river, Got some focus there. And you can use different. You can use different tails uh, on this. I particularly because of the uh, emphasis the emphasis tonight on whiting. Uh, I'm going to use a. Uh, actually, just bought this today. Tailing pack. So it comes with two. Feathers in it. So uh, sorry about that. Got ahead of myself. Get my thread base on that. Okay. Got that tail then uh measure. Okay, well I should just speak up some. Okay, so I just captured that uh oops, off the camera, sorry. Just captured that um tailing material. Pretty standard dry fly type of tailing. I'm going to add a ribbing. I'm going to use a uh, black thread, six out. I'm just going to trim off a section of that off my bobbin. Capture that in for some ribbing later. Set that aside. Got some dubbing. Spirit River fine and dry, so a dry fly dubbing and a uh, olive color. I'll just put a little. I'll just put a little on here, just for the sake of time here. I'm gonna. I'll do one little wrap and get on with it. <clears throat> Two finger twisting. And you're a bit out of focus, Joel. So we can. A little bit of taper. There, there it's back. There it's back. Okay. Yep. So put the tail on. Got <clears throat> got my ribbing hanging out. A little bit of dubbing. Wrap the thread as a ribbing around it to give it some segmentation. Capture that up front, and then back to the whiting part of the demonstration. I'm using that same whiting saddle that I used on the vertical midge. So you can see the different sizes inside of this one saddle. So this being a larger dry fly, I'll go in and pick a little larger feather out of that. I've got single feather here now. I get it to focus back there. <clears throat> Oops. <clears throat> if 
confirm it on the end. Capture that, make some twists, nothing new or different with that. So as you Work those dry flies, you can pick different sizes or different sizes of hooks. You can even oversize them, that's common. Give you a little more floatability. A couple of whip finishes in there. Got a stray in there. Let's see if I can get that back and focus out. It's back in focus now, Joel. There. So I know that's not real sharp and doesn't show up as well as it could or should, but that's my drying green drink pattern uh, using whiting tailing and whiting hack. Yes, it's time for the weekly tip. We're going to talk about containers. We're talking about this. Now, you all from last week when you joined us, that we were in a hurry to get get the uh, Fly Tying Friday uh, completed because we had a bunch of fly tires coming to our house the next day, and we needed to finish setting up for them. And those fly tires were from our local club, and we were tying flies and filling boxes for our upcoming uh, expo uh, rendezvous, if you will, uh, in January. And we tied a heck of a lot. About 10 guys showed up, and we tied a heck of a lot of flies and, and did the boxes. Well, the young fellow sat next to me. Is, I've known him for a long time, and this is his first time to the house. And he is sort of like the equivalent of the Wayne Llewellyn of the fishing world. And if anybody knows who Wayne Llewellyn is, you know he's a very detailed and very skilled individual in the fly tying arena, in the fly fishing arena, too. But Ken happens to be more focused in the fishing arena, but he does a good job in fly tying, and he shared this with me. He says, Al, how do you like this for my beads? I said, well, that's really kind of cool. What this is is four containers down, seven across, 28 containers. And what I liked about it, it is each individual one has a lid, but there's four of them hooked together, so it's not so hard to hold on to it. So imagine with me if you were to put um, large, medium, small, extra small, black, silver, um, copper, and gold. Now that's all the beads that I would normally carry for my stuff. Now, over here on the other side, he had glass beads and, uh, and all kinds of other stuff. Barbells. Bar yeah, barbell eyes and all that type of stuff. Well, anyway, what I wanted to share with you is if you work your cards right, this is two bucks. This package right here that you see with those 28 little containers inside is two bucks. And how does it become two bucks? This is what you get for $16 minus the one that I have sitting over here that was right in this slot before. That's the way the package came from Amazon the other day. So you get eight of these for 16 bucks. Now, am I going to sell these to you? No, I'm not going to try to do that. But what we are going to suggest is that there are groups of fly tires, clubs, et cetera, that can go out. Somebody in the club can go out and buy one $16 packet. And for two bucks a piece, you'll each get one of these. Pretty darn handy. Pretty darn handy, we think. And that's what we're going to be going to be doing now. In the same light, not all things work out. And I'm going to share that one with you. And let's get over here. 
on the very next page on Amazon. That's one of the dangerous things about Amazon. You sometimes get caught up in the throes of, of ordering stuff. And I said, God, sorry, dear, sorry, dear. I thought that the next picture was, um, what is it? Two, four, six, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Anyway, we've got about, I don't know, a lot here in this box. And it's about, uh, oh, a regular 18 by, or it's a, about 10 by 16 box. And what it's got inside of it is a bunch of these individual three quarter inch by three quarter inch by one inch little boxes. I thought, well, this is pretty darn cool. I like that. It looked really good in the picture. It's just too darn big for my fly tying kit. But that's about 18 bucks for that. If you're interested in something like that, great. You know, you can find it by when you go on the follow that other link to Amazon, you'll find it. I don't know what to do with this. I'm going to sit here and I'm turning to all of you for help. What's the use for this? E email, email, email. Don't try to shout it out to me right now. I won't remember it in time to get it written down. But, oh, do you have an idea? Oh, my wife. I Forget it, folks. I think I've got to, I've got to take care of it. I don't know. I okay. Well, anyway, I'm looking for help and what to do with this thing. So it's up to you now. Any questions on the on the uh, weekly tip, though, before? No, it won't work. She's trying to slip a spool of thread in. Just real close, but not quite. Ain't quite fit. If there's no questions on that, we'll go to Sherry. Okay, well, before we go into the sharing part, we bring this uh, channel to you as um, as a service. But if you're ever wanting fly tying instruction, and any of our books will help in that arena, take a look at our website. You can see it there on the screen, along with some of the books that we've published. We'd appreciate your patronage. And with that in mind, <clears throat> let's now go to a thing that we call Sharing on BT's uh, Fly Tying Friday. And what is sharing? Well, it's where all of you in the audience share with us. Oh. Fuck your pictures. Now, David, you can unmute yourself and explain to me what I'm looking at here, starting with the upper left. Wow. So the upper left, I, I found these one and a half inch mini glow sticks on Amazon and tied up a, a couple of minnows trying those out. I actually try, tried them in the test tank and they work pretty darn well in the dark. Um, the top one the the black and purple is tied directly to the shank of the hook and the clouds are there i put it on some heat shrink to to push it behind the bucktail so the bucktail didn't flare up but those last good 30 minutes and we do a lot of dock light fishing down here on the gulf coast and plan to start using those at night but you can find okay. those Mini glow sticks, they're, heck, 10, 15 bucks for 100 of them on Amazon. Yeah, it, we're expecting a report, too. The uh, the turkey there is from a couple years ago, but but Gretchen was picking on me last week about tying a turkey, and I sent that picture back to Al. Um, I'm, I've got a new idea for this year. I hadn't, I hadn't done it yet, though. And then well, the, the bottom picture is just some ghost shrimp that I tied up this past week and sent out a picture of. Very effective with Pompano. Hey, everyone, that's it for tonight. It's a wrap. Until next Friday, please join us. Thanks now.